today. We are very pleased to welcome Dea Kruger, who is a, a professor at uh, in economics at UPenn. Um, he doesn't need an introduction. He's a leading macroeconomist, very well known to us. And today he will be talking about uh, macro, economic, and redistributive effects of this crisis. So uh, over to you, Dirk. Okay, th thanks a lot for having me. So I'm hopefully have at this point shared my screen and you can see my slides. Uh, so what I want to do in the next in the next uh, minutes is to essentially do three things. I want to talk about the epidemic sort of from a broader perspective and then talk about one concrete project that I have together with Andy Glover, Jonathan Heathcote and Victor Rios Roll. Uh, and at the end, I want to briefly mention uh, a project of mine that builds on the paper by Eichenbaum, Rebello, and Trabant that you might have seen uh, in the last uh, in the last week, and give us and, and give my take on on that as well. Uh, and uh, when I talk about the specific project uh, on health versus wealth, uh, I will try to do this on a sort of fairly uh, bird's eye view. Uh, a lot of the details are in the paper. I included a lot of the details in the slides, but there's uh, quite a few slides I won't be talking about because of time, uh, because of time constraints. So when I think about the recent uh, COVID-19 crisis, I would identify three main uh, areas or dimensions of the of the crisis. First, there's the health crisis, and I will show you some data on daily deaths and accumulated deaths. Uh, then the wealth part of the title has to do with the real economy. Uh, what happens to GDP and unemployment? They're the numbers that we have are much more speculative, but I would like to give you those speculative numbers just to put into perspective of just how severe the crisis is and, and could be. And then there's an element that has to do with banking, finance, sovereign debt, and public finance, uh, which is, I think, fascinating, super important, uh, but I won't be talking about, uh, I won't be talking about today. Okay, so if we start from the health dimension, uh, so in this talk, I will use the words Corona crisis and COVID-19 interchangeably, but it's important to keep in mind that uh, COVID-19 is, the, I mean, it stands for Coronavirus Disease uh, 2019. That is the disease caused by the, uh, by the virus, uh, sometimes known as novel coronavirus. Uh, as of this morning, I looked at the numbers from uh, Johns Hopkins University. Uh, there's about 2.75 million confirmed cases. My view is that the number of cases is much, much larger than that. And there's more than 191,000 confirmed deaths worldwide uh, associated with the COVID-19 uh, virus. Uh, let, let me just give you a sort of a sense of how large this is, depending on the area that you're talking about. So uh, the next three slides are taken from a fascinating paper by my colleague Jesus Fernandez Villaverde and Chad Jones. And what they are doing is they take a very standard model from the epidemiology literature called the SIR model, which I will talk about in uh, greater detail later. This is a model that basically models people as being in one of three health states. S stands for susceptible. So these are people that are currently not infected, that have not had the virus, and therefore are in principle susceptible for receiving the virus. I stands for infected. So these are people that currently have the virus and can spread it to others. And R stands for recovered. So these are people that had the virus, have recovered from it, and are not currently infectious. And R could stand for either people that have recovered successfully uh, and are immune, uh, to the disease, or it could be people that had the disease and had died from it from the perspective of the SIR model that makes no difference because both recovered as well as dead are absorbing states and uh, for the evolution of the epidem uh, epidemic doesn't make a difference whether you covered from it or not. So what uh, Jesus and Chad did, they take this model uh, make it flexibly parameterized and estimated for different regions of the world. Just to be very clear, in that paper, there's no economics in that paper. It's a purely statistical paper trying to estimate the best fit on the data. Their view, as well as my view in this talk, is that the hardest data that we have on the virus are death data. So rather than looking at active cases, they only look at data on deaths. And if you do this for New York City, 
you get what's on the slide currently. They use data up until April 12th, try to fit uh, this SIR model through the observed daily death data. And what you see is that uh, initially the virus has exponential increase in death numbers around here. Uh, according to their predictions, right now around we are at the peak of the daily death numbers, and then the death numbers uh, will be coming down. How fast they will come down, that depends on different parameter parameter, parameter values. But the idea is that currently in New York, we are around at peak death numbers, perhaps slightly uh, uh, to the to the left of the peak. If you do this, for example, for Italy, Italy is faster ahead in the epidemic. Uh, so there you can clearly see that the number of daily deaths in Italy has been trending down. And again, depending on assumptions on what you do about further social distancing on how quickly you open up the economy, the predicted further de deaths by this SIR model uh, looks, looks, looks like that. Just to give you a perspective, what does that uh, uh, imply for the total number of deaths in Italy going forward? Uh, you get estimates that look like look like this. So this is uh, the date. So right now we are around around here, and this is the cumulative deaths per million of people. So this is 300, 400, 500. So depending on uh, precise parameter values, uh, the prediction is that Italy will end up uh, in in the number of deaths of, of about four to five hundred. I think this morning, according to Johns Hopkins, the number of deaths in Italy per million inhabitants was 424. And depending on the prediction, you're going to land somewhere between 450 and 500 uh, per million uh, people. So that's about 30,000 people dead from the corona from the corona crisis. So this is a massive health crisis. It has inflicted uh, many, uh, in fact, all countries around the around the globe. One way to uh, further look at just how severe this is, is to plot on the x-axis the days since the first death and on the y-axis uh, the cumulative death per million. Uh, this is a log scale. So, you know, going from here to here doubles the number of cumulative deaths. And what you see is that for many countries early on in the epidemic, you basically get a situation where every two or three days the number of uh, dead people doubles. And then uh, of course, all the effort is about flattening this curve, which, for example, South Korea, which had very rapid growth of early deaths, uh, has then successfully done. This is the Hubei uh, province in, in China. And these are some European countries with very rapid uh, death, uh, death per, per days and recent flattening of the curve in Italy and Spain, uh, maybe less so in France, in the, U in the UK and, 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 and the like. So this is the health dimension of the crisis. It's a very large crisis. It has inflicted uh, all major industrialized economies, and it has a massive death toll. Uh, now let me turn to the economic dimension of the crisis, which with some delay is perhaps equally severe. And the remainder of the talk will really be about the tension between what do we do in order to fend off the health crisis as opposed to the economic cost that such, such measures, measures then entail. And my particular spin on this will be to argue that the benefits from curbing the health crisis the benefit from mitigation efforts, the benefits from shutting down parts of the economy down will very, very largely accrue to older uh, populations, whereas the main cost of the mitigation efforts will mainly be borne by younger people actively in the, in the, in the labor market. So that's why you need both the health dimension, which I've now talked about. And now let me turn to the economic dimension. The economic dimension requires very high frequency data. So this is going to be uh, quite a bit more speculative. I focus here on the United States. Uh, I'm sure there's very good data for, uh, for you, the European uh, economies. I mainly will talk about the United States. And I think our data situation is probably worse than that than that in Europe. So let me show you one picture that I think uh, has, you know, really uh, made people freak out. So this is new unemployment claims over uh, over over time. Uh, so you can see uh, new unemployment claims uh, in the great in the Great Recession. Uh, if you look at the peak of the Great Recession, we had about six hundred fifty-six uh, thousand unemployment uh, new unemployment 
claims in March 2009 at the peak of the Great Recession. So this is a four-week moving average. And then here, towards the end, so these are the most recent data. And here we go to a situation where new unemployment rate uh, uh, claims on average for the last two years, the last data is uh, April, April 11th, are in the order of 5.5 million or another uh, number that you might want to keep in mind about 24 million new unemployment claims in the last four, four weeks alone. So this is a massive collapse of U.S. labor market. Uh, now, the next official number for, un for the unemployment rate are not due until uh, early May. But there's a very nice, very recent paper by Big, Big and Blandin. What they have done, they have basically conducted an internet survey that tries to, in terms of survey design, uh, trace the CPS. And according to their estimates, by mid-April, their estimates of the current unemployment rate in the United States currently based on their survey, and that's certainly consistent with new unemployment claim, is that the unemployment rate in the U.S. is already in the order of 20%, and there's a paper by Faria Castro from the St. Louis Fed that uses this 20 uh, percent number in the estimate of uh, in the estimate of what might be the fiscal uh, policy consequences of that. Now these are not hard data yet. For official unemployment rates, we have to wait until early May. But if I were to have to have a guess of how severe the economic crisis already is in the labor market, I think a twenty percent number is quite is quite plausible. Could well be could well be higher. So this is substantially larger than what happened in the Great Recession, and we are in Great Depression of the early 1930s territory when it comes to the when it comes to the unemployment rate. So this is a very massive, massive event. If you think about how large could be the GDP decline in the second quarter, uh, where we essentially shut down large parts of the economy, uh, again, this is very spec speculative, but if I read reports by Goldman Sachs, more, more should be Morgan Stanley, I think drops in the order of between 20 and 35 percent are certainly in the realm of, of possibilities. So on one hand, you have a major health crisis uh, with substantial number of deaths. I will show you later data that suggests that the death are very concentrated among the older population. On the other hand, you have a collapse in economic activity that is unprecedented in many countries for uh, data after World War II uh, and is certainly on pace to look like the Great Depression of the early 19. Of the early 19. What I want to do in the remainder of the talk, and this is now based on a recent paper that I have with Jonathan Heathcote, Andy Glover, uh, and Victor Rios Roll, and I should say that Andy Glover and Jonathan Heathcote, uh, their employer are the Federal Reserve, is the Federal Reserve System, so nothing that I will say here reflects the official policies or opinions of the Federal Reserve. So what we basically do in this paper is we take uh, the health crisis as given, we build a very simple model of the macroeconomy, and then ask, taking as given what the U.S. did up until April 12th, what should we do from this point on in terms of what share of the economic activity should we lock down in what sectors and how long should we maintain this partial lockdown and when should we try to come back to normal in terms of economic activity? I think that's a very relevant question because that's precisely the policy debate that's currently being led in the, in the public discussion, at least in the, in the US. And in terms of the model structure that is being used here, it's really in a, in a very fundamental sense. It has a health block, an epidemiological block that's based on the standard SIR model. So I want to talk a little bit about, you know, the, the sausage making of this SIR model to give some context context and that then that model is merged with a very simple macroeconomic model where uh, the extent of economic activity is basically determined by two things how many people are healthy enough to work and how many people are allowed to work as opposed to be shut down by government mitigation policy uh, I will then uh, tell uh, try to bring that model to the data and make sure that, that that model represents the actual situation on April 12th of the U.S. economy reasonably well. And then I will ask a simple question. On April 12th, you can play policymaker and you can ask, 
uh, how long should the economic shutdown still last? And what sh what part, what share of the economy should be shut down? And as I said, how long? One policy option is one that was flouted initially by the president. Say, we want to open on Easter. Let's just remove all uh, restrictions. That's one benchmark policy. The policy that's currently in place, to the best of our interpretation, shuts down 50% of the non-essential sector. So the sector that is non-essential for providing health care, food supply, and so forth. And that will last maybe until June, June 30th. And then we will ask the question, okay, from a perspective of social welfare, where I have to tell you what exactly social welfare is, uh, how much should we, how much should we open up? And how quickly should we should we do that? And as I said, the main theme of this entire talk is that there's going to be some very substantial disagreement depending on whether you're an older citizen, mainly uh, subject to massive health risk from the crisis, or whether you're a young worker working in a non-essential sector that's currently being sh shut down, where your employment and uh, income or earning opportunities are basically uh, disappearing, and where you yourself you are subject, of course, to the health risk, but uh, all the data suggests to us that directly uh, you're unlikely to uh, become sick. And even if you do become sick, it's very unlikely that you might die from the from the virus because you're because you're young. And then at some point towards the end, I will say, you know, what what's potentially missing in this in the simple model that you might want to model more directly. Uh, so of course, I'm open to questions at any time. But uh, so, as I said, the broad research question, what is the uh, appropriate economic policy response? The specific question is, how extensive should macroeconomic shutdowns be? Uh, when should they start? When should they end? And the key point of the paper is that there's a very large uh, distributional aspect uh, from, this, from this policy debate, uh, because the main beneficiary of the policies are protecting the old from getting the virus and potentially dying being bought by young, still economically active uh, uh, individuals, and especially those that work in sectors that are deemed non-essential and therefore potentially, potentially subject to a shutdown. If you think about sectors like uh, hospitality, restaurants, and the like, these would be the primary sectors that are affected by this, by this, by this, uh, by the shutdown. So what we, what we, as I said, what we do in this project, we start with a basic epidemiological model integrated into a macro model where economic activity depends on uh, the degree of a shutdown and the degree to which people are sick or not. One key aspect is that those people that are not allowed to work any longer, they have to receive uh, transfers from the rest of societies. And we assume that those transfers are costly because you have to raise revenues, say, with distortion or taxation to transfer to those individuals that are banned from pursuing the economic activity. And then we analyze the combination of optimal shutdown uh, and redistribution policy. And the, the catch, the interaction between these two policy goes like that. If you do more shutdown, you're going to have more unemployed people from the sectors that are not allowed to work anymore. In order to make that palatable, for society, you need more redistribution. You have to provide these people with higher unemployment benefits. But if it's costly to raise the revenues to provide people with these transfers, then the appetite of doing mitigation becomes becomes less uh, less severe, and that interaction uh, might mean that you do less mitigation, less shutdown than otherwise, uh, where redistributional concerns are not on the table. So relative to, say, a representative agent model, where the benefits and the costs are evenly distributed because you have to transfer resources to people that are laid off. And if these transfers come with excess burden of taxation, you might do less mitigation than you otherwise would do in a representative agent model, where redistribution is either off the table or is, is costless. And I will try to demonstrate that uh, in as we go as we go along. Let me just make sure that I'm OK with time. Uh, so if there's no question, then what I want to do now is I want to briefly talk about the basic uh, epidemiological, the SIRR model that many of you might have seen, but I think it is important to understand sort of the, the basic sausage making of that model. I will focus on the intuition and not go through this precise math, but I think all of us that have sort of been thrown in terms of research into this topic, 
I think the first thing that we have tried to learn is uh, how this basic epidemiological model works and where it might potentially be have to be extended in order to make it palatable for economic for economic analysis. Because you might ask, look, you know, we are all economists. Uh, shouldn't we all believe in specialization of labor? Should we not let the epidemiologist work on that part? And we should sit at the sidelines and not worry about that. I will argue that economics has something to contribute. But for that, I think we have to understand very exactly, I think, the interaction between the epidemiologists and the economists have to have to have to like. Ah, OK. The basic SIR model. And as I said, the pictures that I showed you on the health side on the health side from Fernandez Villaverde and Chad Jones basically took that model and estimated a fairly flexible version of that model with actual with actual data. So now I will provide you with a sort of uh, underpinning model that basically these guys have, uh, have, have, have estimated, and also the underlying model that many of us that have worked on this recently have used. For example, the Eichenbaum, Rebello, and Trabant uh, paper is very much built upon that, upon that model. Uh, so let me let me try to explain how that model works. Uh, so this is a model that is cast in continuous time. Uh, Mar Marty and, and, and Sergio and Matthias used a discrete time version of the model, but it works, of course, completely equivalently. So the idea is normalize the population size to one, ignore the fact that there's population growth. This is a model about a very short run. The, an individual can be in three, one of three health states. You can either be susceptible, meaning you don't have the virus, but you can potentially get it. You can be infected meaning you currently have the virus and you can transmit it to other people, or you can be recovered, which might mean that you have had the virus and you have gone through it and now you're immune. The underlying assumption is that once you've had the virus, you're immune to it, or you might have died from it, uh, in which case you obviously also cannot transmit the virus any, any longer. And big S, big I, big R, these are the population shares in these states. At the beginning of the ep epidemic, Nobody has recovered. Nobody has uh, worked through the virus. There's a very small fraction of the population that is currently infected. And, you know, that might come from China in the case of the United States, or this might come from transmissions from animal. Epsilon is meant to be very small, which means that the initial share of people that are in a susceptible state is basically equal, a, equal to one. And then this model is meant to describe the dynamic of the, of the epidemic as it, as it unfolds. And under the hood, there's three differential, or you know, in the case of Eichenbaum et al. in this screen, time three difference equation that describe uh, how the number of susceptible, how the number of infected, and the, how, how the number of recovered people will evolve over time. The dot in front of a, uh, on top of the variable means means the time differ the derivative. So this is the change over time in the number of susceptible, the change in the number of infected, the change in the number of recovered people. And so the, the key two equations and the key two par parameters are, are given here. So the the number of susceptible people, those that are not infected, is reduced over time, and the number of infected people is increasing over time according to the following logic. This is the number of susceptible people. This is the number of infected people. So if you want the product between the two is the number of meetings between somebody that is infected and somebody that is not infected, has not been infected, but is also not immune. And then at intensity beta, these meetings create new infections. So the number of susceptible people is shrinking at this amount. This is the number of meetings, S times I. And beta is basically the intensity at which uh, infections transmit from the I people to the S people. So this term is negative, meaning the number of people that not ha have not had the virus is shrinking over time. Where are these people going? Well, these are exactly the new infections that increase the number of infected people. So the number of infected people increase because there's new infections. And the key parameter that drives how many more infections we have is this parameter beta. On the other hand, there's now an outflow of, of people from the infectious state into the recovered state, where these are the number that, that these are the number of people that are currently infected. A share kappa of them recovers, which either means they had the virus, they worked through the virus, and they are now immune to it. 
and healthy, or they might have died from the virus. So the second key parameter here is kappa. So that's uh, the intensity with which you recover. One over kappa is the expected time length that you spend in the infectious state uh, and uh, are able to infect other people. So the two key parameters is the intensity with which you spread uh, the virus to other people if you are infected, and kappa, where one over kappa is the expected time length that you spend in the infectious in the infectious states. So these are, in the very basic model, the two key parameters that you have to get a handle on that will tell you how this epidemic unfolds. In fact, what is really key, and I will show you to show that to you in, in, in terms of the, the, the basic math, is the ratio between beta bet between beta and R, because remember that one over kappa that's the expected time that you spend in infectious states times beta. That's the intensity with which you transmit uh, the the infection. So R zero, which has you know it's a, it's 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 a famous number. It has a name, basic reproduction number. That's the expected number of infection generated by one person that is infected. And to first approximation early in the in the epidemic, that's the number that you want to get a handle on. How large is that? The larger is this number, the more rapidly uh, the, the the virus the virus spreads. And what I would say, what I would say, and I, I will say that on the next slide, what really economics has to contribute is, you know, if you're an epidemiologist, it's clear that you want to figure out how big is R zero, and you want to perhaps think about, you know, how is that R zero perhaps changing over time. I think the main insights of all the models that economists have recently constructed is that this R0, especially because of the parameter beta, this beta is not a policy invariant parameter, but that's exactly where economic mitigation, economic activity affects this beta with the ideas that the more economic activity you have, the more infections per infected people you're going to have, the larger is beta. So clamping down on economic activity will reduce this beta and maybe the biggest contribution that these 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 recent economic models with an epi epi uh, part have is to try to get a handle on how big is the derivative of beta with respect to economic with respect to economic activity. That's exactly where the interface interface between health with, between health and epidemiology on one hand and economics is on the on the other hand. Just to give you sort of a basic idea of how this works, uh, um, you know, you, yeah. Derek. Before you move to this part, I have a clarifying question. Mm -hmm. um, so it seems that these models treat recovery and death as identical. Yeah. But but death shrinks the size of the population while recovery does not. So absolutely, uh, absolutely. So on the next slide, I will actually break them up, and then in our economic model, that is precisely one of the the factors. So we will actually argue that this SIR model. For our purposes, is not quite rich enough. I will break it up a little bit. And one of the things that you have to do in the richer model is to break up this R into a share of people that do recover and a share of people that actively actively die because the recovered people, these are the perfect guys that you want to send back to the labor market if you know who they are. Whereas the dead people, of, your, of course, you can cannot do that. But from the basic mechanical evolution of the epidemic itself, it doesn't really matter whether the recovered people recover and are dead or are recovered and they are healthy under the assumption, and that might be an assumption that might not be a great assumption, and there's a lot more research to be done, that the recovered people are in fact immune to the uh, disease once they have recovered. Right. Uh, so what I'm saying is that from a basic epidemiological point of view, it doesn't matter. From an economic point of view, it hugely matters. And we will integrate that distinction into our economic model uh, very much because it makes a huge makes a huge difference. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah I, I meant it more from a mathematical point of view that in the, yeah. in, in the differential equation, the, the third one. Yeah. Since everything is normalized, size population of one actually. It, Aren't these models sort of assuming that the death rates are sort of relatively small so that you can approximate it with this, this equation? That, 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 yes, that, 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 is, that, that is certainly true. Uh, I mean, so early in the uh, epidemic, uh, death rates are zero, but even at the height of the academic, uh, epidemic, I uh, know we're talking about 
at most perhaps, I mean, that's my hope, 30,000 deaths in Italy relative to a population of 60 million. So this is probably not a bad assumption, but both recovery as well as death from the perspective of the model are absorbing states since there, I mean, if you, if you see where R comes back, R never feeds back anywhere here. So the feedback is not, is not, is not there. Now, if you think that, you know, how many people die, that might affect the birth rate and therefore population growth, then of course, this is not the accurate model. But as long as recovery, both healthy recovery as well as death are absorbing states for, for these, for these differential equations, it really doesn't matter whether, whether you're dying or not. For the economics, obviously it does, but not for the dynamics of the, of the, of the, of the system. Uh, so let me uh, let me talk briefly about how about the beginning of the epidemic. So you can take this equation and divide it by i. Then you get the growth rate of infections, and that's given by this. The early times of the epidemic. In the early periods of the epidemic, the number of susceptible people is close to one, because number of infected play close to zero. So to a first approximation, early in the epidemic. The growth rate of infection is beta minus kappa because the number of susceptible people is close to one. And the change in the number of susceptible people, which is given by this, uh, by this term, is close to zero because the number of inf infected people is very small. So in the first, say, 10, 15, 20 days of the epidemic, you can think of this as close to zero. You can think of this as close to zero, which means that uh, the growth rate in the early epidemic is just given by how many people uh, a new person infects minus the recovery rate. And therefore, early in the epidemic, basically the number of infected people e evolves as an exponential function. The exponential function is this term, which means that whether the growth rate is positive or negative, exclusively depends on this R0, this basic reproduction number. If that number is bigger than one, you get an exponentially growing uh, number of infected people. If it's smaller than one, then the epidemic never gets off, off the ground. From the epidemic, how rapidly the ep epidemic evolves depends exclusively on this, on this number R0, and that's why the focus on this R0 is so is so important. And I would say, as I said before, the main contribution of economics is to, to point out that beta might not be policy invariant. It might not be invariant to social interactions, of course. And of course, the epidemiologists understand this. And it might also not be invariant to economic activity. And the key aspect of all of this research is some time to come to grips to the fact of how strongly does R0 depend on economic activity through this parameter. Data. The other thing that you can do in terms of very basic math is you can ask, okay, this is a very short run. The upshot of this equation, forget about details of this, that early in the epidemic, you can expect exponential growth of infections and the speed of that, uh, that growth is basically determined by beta kappa or that basic reproductive number. And that's why people are so obsessed trying to figure out how big that, that really is. Is it three? as early research on China suggests, and how quickly does it come down? Has it come down below one, where it means that the epidemic is, is, is subsiding? Also can ask it, what happens on, on the long run? How many people get never infected, and how many people will get the disease, and how many people will die? I will At the end of the day, there of people that never have been infected as star, solves this it's 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 mathematically it's it's a transcendental equation that has a unique solution somewhere between zero and one and the number of people that had the disease at some point is one minus s because in the long run there won't be any infected people left well uh this is the number of people that at some point uh has have had the disease uh, let's take the assumption that there's a constant case fatality rate, a certain share of people that have a disease die, new. You can actually calculate from that very simple formula the share of people that at some point have had the disease, a fraction new of them die. Best estimates suggest that for all people that 
uh, fatality rate is quite substantial, perhaps in the order of 1% to 2% for people above 65. For young people, that number is fairly small, perhaps one-tenth of a percent. So if you give me the total number of people that at some point during the epidemic have been inf infected, that's R star, then I can tell you the total number of people that will die from this ep epidemic according to the simple model. And if you and you know the number of people that at some point during the epidemic will have had the disease is one minus the number of people that will never have had the disease. And according to this model, this solves the simple equation. If you really want to have a dirty first approximation, you give me that basic reproductive number. And if that number is not too far away from one, then as a first approximation, this is the share of people that never had it. So if this number is two, if each infected person infects uh, uh, two additional people, then the share of people that will never have had the disease in the long run is 50%. The number of people that at some point will have had the disease is also 50%. And the number of dead people will be, say, take two tenths of 1%, so 0.02%. 0.2%, multiply that by 50%, and that's your best prediction of how many death people, dead people you're going to have as the epidemic evolves. But that might take quite a while. So the number of death that we currently observe is only a very imperfect approximation of that. So the nice thing about the SIR model, this is all analytically tractable, and you can make predictions under the assumption that this R0 is a fairly constant parameter and that you have a precise estimate of what this R0 is. Bottom line, that R0 is a super important. What does economics have to figure out? How strongly does this R0 respond uh, to, economic, to economic activity? So this is all broad reading of epidemiology from my perspective, from the perspective of our paper. I'm getting late. This is not quite fine enough. Our paper, we basically say, well, the simple model has only infected people, but it makes a huge differences, difference whether these people are infected, but they have the infection, they have the virus, but they don't have any symptoms. They are also asymptomatic. So in our paper, what we basically do, we take the infected and we break them up in three states. Those that have the virus, but they don't have any symptoms which means they might not know about having the virus. And the key aspect of these asymptomatic is these guys still go to work if they are allowed to. They go shopping and they transmit the virus at the workplace, at the store and at home because they are asymptomatic. Nobody knows that they have it, maybe not even themselves. Then there's a group of people that have the virus and they have uh, developed some flu-like symptoms. We call that F. And then there are some people that not only have flu-like symptoms, but they have become severely uh, sick and they have to go to the emergency room. We call them E. So we basically take the SIR model and make it into a safer SIR model, where safer simply stands for susceptible, asymptomatic, uh, flu-like symptoms, emergency room, and then recovered. And among the recovered, as Luke said, uh, one should split up those people that have recovered and those people that have died. So in our uh, more evolved model, the worst case disease progression is that you start not having the virus, you go to work, or you go shopping, or you get contaminated with the virus, you become infected but asymptomatic. You still happily go to work, you don't have any symptoms, you still happily go shopping. Then if you are unlucky, uh, you develop symptoms. You don't go to work anymore. You have, might have other people go shopping for you. Uh, that uh, changes your infection, uh, the spread with which you uh, spread the disease. Uh, then if you are unlucky, you develop really severe symptoms. So the transition from year to year, mainly old people, Young people can happen too, but it's unlikely. And then if you're really unhappy, unlucky, then you die. But at any point in this chain, there's a good chance that you will recover. And the way we model is that the recovery rates are very strongly age dependent because actually the transition between susceptible and infected but asymptomatic don't vary all that much by age, according to our reading. In fact, young people are more prone to getting the disease. But then the transition between uh, having symptoms, having very severe symptoms and potentially dying, these probabilities are much, much larger. 
multiple people. So what we do, we basically take this model, but enrich it into this safer model that includes these three stages of being infected. And again, the key difference is that the guys that are asymptomatic, they have the virus, they can spread the virus, but since they don't have symptoms, they continue to go to work. And it's exactly that these are the people who are on targets, meaning these are the people that are locked down uh, from a policy uh, that says you can't go to work because you might spread the virus. You don't know it. We don't know it. But uh, you know, your economic activity is being reduced because you're infectious and infect other, other, other people. Uh, into this basic uh, into this very basic epidemiological model. We have an economic very stylized. So let me just give you the very uh, basic uh, uh, bare bones of the model. Uh, in order to study redistribution, we have three types of people, young and old, work anymore, but they are very susceptible to condition on getting the virus dying. Then there's two groups of young people. Young people either can work in a basic sector which we think of as healthcare, food production. That's a sector you cannot shut down. It's central for economic survival. And uh, the young people in the basic sector, they always work and they are not subject to a shutdown. And then there's young workers working in the luxury sector, restaurant, entertainment, and so forth. This is a sector that in terms of production looks very similar to the basic sector, but the government can go to that sector and shut down a fraction M of that sector. So only a fraction one minus M of that sector is producing. So output in the luxury sector is all the people that can work because they are they either are not infected or they're infected but don't have symptoms or they have recovered. So this is a group of people that are not uh, having economic, not having flu-like symptoms and are not in the emergency room. So these are the people in the luxury sectors that don't have symptoms either because they're not uh, uh, they're not infected yet they are infected but they have not developed symptoms or they are recovered so this is the number of bodies that in principle could work then the government shuts down as a part of that sector with the share m so one minus m is output in the luxury sector output in the basic sector is all the bodies working in that sector that can show up for work total output is then given by the sum of the two perfect section. Key One key assumption is that people in the basic sector have to work in the basic sector. People in the luxury sector have to work in the luxury sector. There's no substitution. And the key part where the government shutdown comes in, it shuts down part of the luxury sector, which has two effects. It reduces output and it sends a share of these workers that in principle could work it sends them home. Why would the government potentially do that? Because it exactly is these people, those people uh, that have the disease, don't know about it, are asymptomatic. They are super spreaders of the disease. And since you don't know who these people are, one way to curb the infections from these people is part of the sector. Now, of course, in an ideal world, if you have large testing, what, what would you do? You would test a bunch of these people without symptoms try to distinguish between those and especially between this and those. And once you know that these are people that don't have uh, symptoms, but they already have had their disease, those you send to work and those guys, you uh, keep them at home. But without effective testing, one very, very core substitute is to send one minus M uh, of these people home in order to avoid the, the spread of the, the virus. Uh, the economic model then says, okay, we have sent a part of... Derek, Derek uh, sorry, w one other question on this. So the young are more prone to contagion. That, that's also a, a key uh, assumption for yeah. some of the policy prescriptions, right? Yes, yes. Um, so it is, it is the case that the way, the way contagion works, you can either transmit the disease in the workplace, you can work it while consuming, you can do it through social transactions. And then if you happen to be in the hospital, you can transmit it to the nurses. And the assumption is not that the young are endogen, are exogenously more transmitting, but since the young go to the workplace, and since part of the transmissions happen in the workplace, the young are more at risk of transmitting the disease to other people, just simply because they are more at risk getting it at work Whereas the old people, they are not currently working. And it's not that there's anything that is special about mm -hmm. the old 
Uh, it's just that they don't have uh, as much production activity and therefore less prone of uh, infecting other people. Conditional on receiving the infection, of course, the old guys are much more likely to develop severe symptoms and dying from the disease. And that's something that we'll try to calibrate somewhat. Yeah, so I understand. I'm just uh, asking this question because I don't know about the US, but at least in Europe, there's a lot of talk, uh, discussion around some of these um, care facilities, these old people's homes where, so if you have all the old locked up in yeah. one place, then maybe this is a kind of a strong assumption. And maybe, I mean, I think your model can speak to it, but you probably come yeah. come down mm -hmm. at a very different policy prescription, right? Because then you have yeah. all the forces pull in the same direction. Yeah. So I think where, where, where this is, where this is perhaps too cause is the situation. So there is, I think, uh, you know, it starts with the young people. The young people are more prone to getting this. Then they go to visit their, their, their parents, especially if they are asymptomatic. They don't know they have the disease. They visit their parents. They infect old people. And then there's a little bit of a feedback from old people to young people. And I think that transmission from old to the young if you could insulate the old more effectively, and if you could institute a policy that says the young people cannot visit the old people because you lock them in, in facilities and you don't allow visitation, of course, that would be a very effective way to curb that transmission back. And what when we bring our model to the data, one thing that seems very clear, there must have been something really massively happened in the US around mid-March, where this R0 numbers that initially according to our judgment, was very high. It must have fallen quite substantially according to the uh, our reading of the evidence. And I think this is a very effective way where we realize old people in nursing home, they are very prone to getting this. They are very prone towards dying. You basically want to separate them from the rest of society. And by doing so, it very much slows the transmission of the, of the disease. Absolutely. So just to complete... Uh, the economic part of the model. So then there's basically two types of policies that the government has. It can control how much of that luxury sector to shut down. But then you have a bunch of workers that in principle could work but can't earn income because they're shut down. Uh, so the second part of economic policy is redistribution. There's two groups of people, essentially, those that can continue to work and earn income. And then those people that are shut down from working and earning income, so you have to give them transfer. So CN is the amount of consumption that the people that currently do not work receive. How does that work? These are basically direct transfers through unemployment benefits from the working people to the non-working people. And one assumption is that that act of transfers is costly, meaning if you want to transfer $1 from workers to non-workers because of distortionary taxation and center of reasons, it's going to cost you $1.38. 38 cents of extra cost to make that transfer because of uh, because of incentive costs. And so the play, uh, the interplay between these two policies is how much mitigation want you, do you want to do? do it, how much you want to do it? How much of that sector you want to uh, down? Then you know that the more you shut down, the more people you have to which you have to transfer. Transfers are costly, and that will reduce your appetite to do towards doing mitigation in the first place relative to a world where everybody is identical, a representative agent, where you don't have this concern about redistribution. So at the end of the day, uh, our economic model is basically an optimal policy, policy design problem that asks how much do you want to shut down, when, when do you want to stop, and how much transfers do you want to give to those people that are not working and there's this feedback loop between those uh, between the degree of mitigation and the degree of transfers because uh, transfers are costly and therefore that reduces the government's uh, appetite for these transfers okay so i don't want to talk about the details of the model and in fact i think given the time i probably don't have time to talk about the calibration in great detail but let me just mention there's a bunch of parameters in these models. What do we think is really important? At, to a first approximation, what is really important is what's the main benefit of these shutdown policies? Well, you save old people from dying. In these type of models, you have to take a stance on how much is that worth? How much is it worth to keep old? And you know, 
object to this from an ethical perspective that economists think about the value of life and put some number on how valuable it is to keep people alive. But if you want to talk about optimal policy, there's no way around quantifying how valuable is it to, pe to keep all people alive. Agencies, for example, in the US that quantify what is called the value of a statistical life. Because if you want to evaluate an environmental uh, projects, you want to ask how much uh, is it worth to save an extra life through environmental production. So these government agencies have to come up with numbers. If you take their numbers, the value of life is quite high. Let me translate that a little bit. Maybe if you take the number from the Environmental Protection Agency of the US at face value, it is corresponding to a flow value of about $515,000 or about 11.4 times end consumption. So that's how much it is worth protecting one extra year of life to take a stance on that. So this is one important uh, parameter. The other thing that is super important so, so is- there, so, Sorry mm -hmm. to interrupt each time. On this, there's actually a, a question on, the, on this kind of related to this value of life. Of course, what, what you're talking about here is sort of for, from the perspective of society as a whole, the, the question is, what would happen if if young people would be altruistic versus the old yeah. and value That's the cool. life of the old? So it's yeah. slightly different. How, how yeah. would that? Numbers, because I will look at sort of social welfare, which is the way that some of the welfare of uh, these three groups, I, effectively, we have three groups, right? We have old people, we have young people in the basic sector, we have young people in the luxury sector. One thing I will ask, suppose the old guys were dictatorial and they can determine. And this is sort of a world where either the old people have all the say or the young people internalize utility of the old people by being altruistic. So I can show you relative to uh, utilitarian social welfare function, how much more mitigation you would do and how, long, how much longer would mitigation uh, occur. So I, I will show you exactly those, those numbers. So to first approximation, if the old guys are dictatorial, I don't think the old guys are dictatorial at all. This is an approximation to a world where you value the old directly and you value the old through the lifetime utility of the young because they're like their parents. Really important in this type of exercise, and we struggled quite a bit with it, is to come to grips of what I will here call initial conditions. Our thought experiment is you sit here on April 12th, and now you have to decide how much longer to do shutdown, how large should the shutdown be. You have to get a sense on how does the world look in April on April 12th. And the key unknown is how many infected people do we have that are asymptomatic that can transmit the disease but don't have any symptoms. Now, again, if you had great testing, if you could test the entire population, this would not be an issue. But currently, certainly in the US, we have no idea uh, how big this number is. So what we try to do is we, we are going to say, and this is broadly summarized on, on this slide, if you, if you wonder, is we take as hard facts the number of dead people, and maybe even that is severely underestimated. But on March 21, there were 300. On April 12, this exploded to 22,000. And what we are saying is that what does, what do the basic transmission rate, these basic reproductive numbers have to be to rationalize a world where initially you have a very small number of deaths, then this explodes, but it explodes within, within a matter of three weeks, the number of deaths explodes, so you have exponential growth. But at the same time, the number of daily deaths is not all that high. And this leads you basically to a view of the world that says on March 21, that are already infected, that, but are asymptomatic. So to the best of our estimate, on March 21, you have about 5.5 million of people that are already infected but don't have symptoms, much, much larger than the caseload of people that are officially uh, at that age uh, uh, infected and have, and have the, the symptoms. And when you look at these death rates and you try to come to grips with it, that tells you that initially these infection rates must have been really, really high, leading to a lot of deaths on April 12th. 
But on the other hand, this must have, must have come down very dramatically. And we interpret this as the outcome of social distancing efforts by governments, voluntarily social distancing by people, and economic shutdowns that exactly started around that time where states basically shut down the economy. So a drastic reduction in this basic reproduction number that makes it such that you have a ton of people that are already infected, leading to deaths three weeks later, because it takes a while for people from infection of asymptomatic, asymptomatic state to the death state. But at the same time, the number of daily deaths is not all that large. And that can only be consistent with the data if the number of new infections starting around this time has been reduced very, very substantially, meaning the number of newly infected per infectious must have come down very dramatically. We think it's under one. And again, where does that come from? social distancing, as well as partial shutdown of the, of the economy. Okay, then let me, let me just give you a few numbers because I think I should, uh, I should wrap up. Wrap up. Uh, so basically, we look at three time paths of mitigation policy. Our thought experiment is whatever got us to April 12th, that's what it is. On April 12th, the policymaker has a choice to make of how much is that 50% of the non-essential sector is shut down. That's about 27% of the overall economy. That's certainly consistent with the 20%, 25% unemployment rate that I've shown you at the beginning. So policy one is open up at Easter. That's what the president said. At Easter, we open up, open up, open up anything from April 12th on no further economic mitigation, social distance, Distancing. People still do what is privately optimal in terms of social distancing, but no economic lockdown. That's one policy. The baseline policy is not that. Our baseline policy is to keep the current lockdown measure in place up until June 30th. And again, the magnitude is that shuts down about 27% of the economy or 50% of this non-essential sector. And then we will say, okay, what is optimal? Where I will look at optimal by saying weighted sum of lifetime utilities of these three groups, the old guys, the young guys in the sector that will never shut down, and the young guys in the sector where you have a 50% problem or you're a and you got shut down and you can't work any, any further. So let me show you what happens then. So let me first focus on these two policy, the baseline and opening up on Easter. This basically shows the number of daily deaths under these two scenarios. So this is the baseline scenario. We are right now in the US, we are about at, uh, or let me let me immediately go to the number of deaths. The baseline scenario says around now, we have about 2,000, 2,500 daily deaths in the United States under this baseline scenario where 50% of the non-essential sector is uh, shut down. You keep that shut down until uh, June 30th, then you lift it. And what you see is the number of daily death will increase again before it comes down. So the observation here is that daily deaths are about where they are right now under the, the baseline policy. You keep the luck, but it's still stubbornly high. You uh, remove the lockdown, you're gonna get a rebound of the virus. And it's going to take quite, quite a while for these daily deaths to come down to zero. Certainly by the end of the year, this is not completely, completely done. If you wonder how many people, you know, are in emergency hospital and how many emergency spots do you have? This is about consistent with being almost at capacity in terms of the emergency room. What would have, have happened? Suppose you open up at Easter. This is the counterfactual scenario of opening up at Easter. The number of deaths would be multiplied by three. The emergency room would be overrun. And part of the number of deaths that we simulate come from the fact that you're going to get a big spike in the demand for emergency hospital. And our assumption is once you add capacity, the death rate of having more people in the emergency room that you can handle spikes. From a pure health perspective, this is a disaster. You know, you're going to get 6,000 deaths death per year. On the other hand, the epidemic informs much more quickly and you go to zero death much more, much more rapid. 
This plot basically shows that two thirds of all the deaths are concentrated among the older, elderly, uh, the ones that are 65 years and, and older. And again, baseline. And if you would have opened up at Easter, a big problem with opening up at Easter, you want to, you're going to kill a bunch more old people because um, those are the guys that are more severely, severely dying. You can calculate the total number of deceased people under the baseline scenario where you open up on June 30 and the scenario where you open, open up at Easter. And what I would think is, is optimal, which I will argue is somewhere in between, but close to the, the baseline scenario of keeping it up up until June 30th. If you wonder what's the gap, it's about 200,000 additional deaths coming from the fact of relative to keeping lockdown until June 30. So the number of cumulative deaths that you avoid if you keep in the lockdown, lockdown longer relative to opening up at Easter is about 200,000 extra extra death. And the number of, uh, and you know, this, this corresponds to about 0.1% uh, of the population. So under the baseline policy, we're going to have about 0.1% of the population dying eventually from this virus. Opening up at Easter, that goes up to about 0.2%. Uh, in the optimal policy, this is about 1.13%. Uh, how about optimal policy? Suppose you ask the old how much mitigation you want to have. The result is even the old would say 0.5% might be a bit too high. So current mitigation policy is perhaps too extreme. And why would the old say that? Well, because the old understand that it's going to keep you safe, but it affects consumption. And since consumption has to be financed by transfers from the rest of the economy, part of the economy is shut down. Even the old would say current mitigation is probably too severe. But crucially, the old would say, let's keep it for much longer. Let's keep it, say, until the beginning or the end of August before we wind it down, because that will minimize the epidemic and that will minimize the number of deaths. If you ask the, the luxury workers, those workers whose sector is shut down, way less shut down and want to have it revoked much more rapidly, why is that the case? Well, they also understand more mitigation leads to less health transitions. It leads to less death among them because they get infected by working. But on the other hand, they also they are very strongly severely affected economically. Now, they do get transfers from the rest of the economy, but since transfers are costly, their consumption drops very substantially. And this reflects the fact that, true, they're going to get unemployment benefits, but unemployment benefits do not re replace nearly the income that they would have earned if the sector has not shut down. So th these are the old. These are the young in the luxury sector. If you take away the average, what we think is as optimal, that's the blue line. The blue line says, how much should you shut down the economy according to a utilitarian social welfare function? What we currently do, but you should keep it for longer towards July and August because that will basically avoid this. I mean, if you, if you re, uh, get the, get the, shut down and then remove it end of June, you get this rebound of the virus. If you keep it longer, the blue line is optimal. That rebound is being, is being avoided. And if it's not costly to transfer, if there's no dead weight law shift optimal mitigation up, then you do more of it. That's to be expected because that just means that it's easier to transfer to the old, it's easier to transfer to the people that get mitigated, and therefore uh, being unemployed uh, by sh being shut down out from the from the luxury sector is not such a big not such a big deal. The last thing I want to show you: the welfare gains or losses from these policies are very asymmetric. Basically, along the optimal policy, utilitarian weighted sum of lifetime utility. The old guys very strongly favor that policy. It's 1.1% of lifetime consumption. Young guys, especially those in the luxury sector, they are fairly ambivalent between a policy that it has a partial shutdown or in a policy that opens up on Easter. And, and, and it's clear why, because these people, on one hand, they do value the fact that they're going to die less likely by being infected more likely if the economy is opening up at Easter. But on the other hand, their consumption takes a strong lick. 
the basic effect is they are basically indifferent between opening up at Easter or opening up optimally according to this blue blue line. The guys in the basic sector, for them, it looks a bit more a bit better because they are not as severely affected in terms of their consumption. And the old, as I said, they are the main beneficiaries of that policy because it effectively keeps them alive. If you actually just ask the old, what is their preferred policy? Much more mitigation. You're going to get larger welfare gains for, for the old. Obviously, it's their preferred policy. And now you see the young guys in the luxury sector, the preferred policy by the old, which is extended lockdown for a long period of time, they actually find that less appealing than an immediate rev revocal of the shutdown at, at Easter. They suffer from that debate. So if you want to tell a political economy story of the current protest at the state capitals in the United States about opening up the economy, you say, look, you guys, you politicians, you're old, you like those policies to protect the old people. You have implemented a policy that is welfare reducing for us because we get shut down. Uh, we rather want to open up the economy immediately. So there's very strong redistributive consequences between the old and the luxury workers in the sun of the young that are mitigated that are mitigated uh, through the, the, the economy. These numbers become even larger if uh, if redistribution is costless because then they do more more mitigation. So let me just conclude here. The main results seem to suggest that relative to what we currently have in place, you want to have substantive shutdowns, but perhaps at a lower level. So maybe the shutdowns are too severe, but you want to have them for longer, certainly until the end of the summer. The welfare gains from the shutdowns are very unevenly distributed, large for the old, much smaller for the young. And if redistribution is less costly, you want to do more of, of mitigation. Clearly, the results are sensitive to parameter values, especially the value of life. And Luke already has, has asked one such question. If you increase the value of life, you want to do more mitigation. If you reduce the value of life, you're going to do less. Obviously, it's very sensitive to how big is R0, how quickly does the disease spread without any mitigation effort. Effort and it's very sensitive to the probability condition on contracting the virus, how likely you are, are to die. Now, on one level, and let me conclude with this slide. So, you know, what is this model about? It's a fairly elaborate model of the epidemic. It's some very coarse description of economic policy. So the government is fairly involved here. What is perhaps missing is that here private agents don't do all that much. They don't have that many. Uh, margins along which to adjust their private behavior. And that is, of course, potentially important. So, for example, if you have strong incentives to adjust your savings behavior, Club, Kaplan, Violante, and Moll have suggested that that leads to very asymmetric effect between those guys that have very little assets and those guys that have a lot of them. And let me conclude by saying that here, our assumption was there's people working in one sector, the luxury sector, that sector gets nailed, people get mitigated. And there's not too much they can do about that. And then there's some people working in the basic sectors, the basic sector you cannot shut down. Maybe the basic sector is also one where infections are not all that large. Suppose people can actually adjust their economic activity towards the sectors that are less infectious. Then uh, that is very important. And just to to end with that, you might have you might remember the paper by Eichenbaum, Rebella, and Trabant where they are basically a representative agent model with one representative sectors, and they say without any mitigation effort, you're going to get this massive consumption recession, and you get this massive increase in the number of dead people. You might remember that plot from their presentation. Suppose you allow people to adjust across sectors, and sectors are heterogeneous with respect to how infectious they are, because some sectors, you have to work, you're waiter. Some sectors, food delivery at home, giving seminars from my office. Suppose there is substitution ability in a paper with uh, Harald Ulrich and she from the uh, University of Singapore. We played that out. And just the substitution possibilities across sectors in a basic Eichenbaum-Rebella trial economy, 
once you allow people to substitute and you have some plausible elasticity of substitution across goods, what you're going to get, you're going to get a consumption recession in the benchmark where elasticity is fairly high. Instead of 10%, you get a consumption recession of 1.5%. And in, instead of having an epidemic, much more mitigated. And why? Because people individually rational adjust and go to sectors in terms of their consumption and work that are less prone towards infections. And if that elasticity of substitution is very large, and if people practice some social distancing, uh, according to our estimates, the epidemic never gets off the ground. So this is a little bit the Swedish solution. If you have strong incentives and strong mitigation forces from private behavior, it might be the case that that is so strong that the epidemic is mitigated in its infancies. So this would be our optimistic view of the Swedish solution, but it does require very strong uh, private incentives. It does require very strong substitution possibilities, and it does require perhaps a government that coordinates on these substitution possibilities. So it's not saying the government should stay out and Chicago style, nobody should intervene, but it should perhaps mean that the government should coordinate private actions towards sectors that are like less, less, less infectious. Many thanks, Dirk, for this uh, very rich presentation. Um, you have been very generous with your time. We we basically have run out of time, big time. Um, there were a few more questions, but uh, um, fortunately, we don't have time for those. Um, but I, I did want to, if I may, Im impose on you with a last question. Since you are one of the world's leading public finance experts. I know that that was outside of the scope of your talk today, which just sort of ended a little bit on a note. Um, that's why I thought I would ask you, since what's very nice about these heterogeneous models is that you see these transfers between the young and the old, and that is also the political economy very much so. What is sort of, uh, uh, in, in a few sentences, sort of, uh, a big message you would have for us on the public finance front, since we also discuss uh, these issues with fiscal authorities uh, on a daily basis. Yeah, so I mean, I think from the perspective of the model, so here the transfers between the young and the old have to come out of current output. So I mean, the obvious next step would be to think, okay, let's do that partially with government debt. And of course, you know, Governments around the world do exactly that. If you want to evaluate that, I think the next step would be to embed that into a full overlapping generations model where there's future generations and part of the burden will be pushed on future generations. Now, uh, in, in our essential world, basically think of the young as not only about the current young, but the young people having children and valuing future generations as well. So this basic trade-off with government debt could be represented between the old and the young. And the clear default line is obviously the old want to, uh, want to have this, this type of policy in place being financed with public debt, whereas current and future generations are looking, you know, you're going to saddle us with tremendous amounts of, uh, of public debt, and we might not want to like that. So it's clear that you want to do public debt. And uh, the redistributional consequences are not so much between the young and the luxury and the young in the in the in the in the basic sector, but between the between the old now and future generations. And that's I, so I, I've started working on that because I'm very concerned about future generations, partially because part of the lockdown and that's not here at all is you know I have three kids at home, they're not go to school, they don't learn anything. I mean they have distance learning, but that's sort of more or less useless. What's going to happen to their human capital accumulation? What happens to long-run growth at the, same, at the same time where we have an explosion of public debt? Now, I think that using public debt with a crisis is very much what you should be doing in terms of smoothing. But the long-run effect on future generation, that is absolutely there. You need an overlapping generation model to model it. It's very much, I mean, certainly on my agenda and Alex Ludwig, who's here in Frankfurt and, and, and myself, we are starting really very much trying to work on that because that is absolutely crucial. I mean, my view is that right now the world is burning, groups with a very short run. The long run is all about public debt and human accumulation for, for, for the young generation. And that's the next generation of the models. Thank you for that, Dirk. Uh, so we will be looking forward to, to that work from you. We'll keep an eye out for that. 
and uh, maybe be in touch on that again. So for now, on behalf of the ECB, uh, thank you very much for making some time in your schedule. I know it's early still there. So enjoy the rest yeah. of your day. Yeah. Um, let, stay healthy, let me, please. Let me just one last remark. So the two papers I talked about, they're on my website. If you have any questions, I will happily answer any emails. So I, you, know, you know where to find me. And I'll, I'll happily share the slides as well of those papers with you if you want to disseminate them in any way. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not running from any questions by running out of time. I'm happily answering any of those that your economists, your staff, any of you might, might have. And thanks, yeah. thanks for having me and giving me the opportunity to, to speak to you guys. Okay. Thanks for your generosity.